Thank you, Lisa. Um, and yes, we've been quite busy, and we have a very big story to tell, um, much bigger than the 15 minutes. And I've learned that the way to do that is to be ruthless. And since we're in a church, I'm going to start off by asking your forgiveness for my ruthless brevity in telling the story. Um, oh, and I should start my slides. And the title of my story if, is, If You Want to Change the World, Look to the Margins. Now, how many of you here are homeowners? Okay. And how many have you, of you have embarked upon what seems like a very doable task to renovate something or fix something, only to discover that you uncover that your foundations are broken and your house is about to fall down? And it, it's a much larger task than you thought. <laughs> Well, that's sort of uh, our, been our experience over the last couple of years. So what was our very doable task? The very doable task was to make OER accessible to students with disabilities and ensure that OER will meet accessibility legislation globally so that this won't be an impediment to adoption. And the straightforward approach would have been to just fix all the resources. But how many resources are there, how many can be fixed, is fixing them actually a good thing, and will this actually serve the learners, were the questions that we asked ourselves. And we soon discovered this is not just about OER. It's connected, and I wish I had used those uh, things we used yesterday <laughs> during the exercise, but it's connected to how digital technologies are designed, um, accessibility legislation and policy, and special service delivery processes globally. And each of these, in fact, needs to be addressed before we can actually fix the very doable task we've discovered. So why is that? Well, the first thing that uh, we learned very quickly, what that we've sort of known for quite some time, is that there's some problems with how digital technologies are developed. Standard digital technologies are designed for the typical or average user, and that's usually where they stop. And in legislation, in policy, in sort of corporate design, uh, those ICT companies or producers depend upon assistive technologies to bridge the gap. And then even our legislation is built that way. Our, the standard technologies need to work with the assistive technologies. However, the assistive technology industry and the um, assistive technology ecosystem is crumbling. It's not very technically viable. If I'm a screen reader producer, my screen reader has to work with everything and anything on your computer. And how many times this week have you done an update or an upgrade? Um, how many people have done an update or upgrade of their systems in, in the last little while? Yes. Even probably as we're speaking, some of you are upgrading and updating. Um, and how many of the companies that produce those software systems do you think make all of their APIs open and accessible and help assistive technology vendors to fix their screen readers, et cetera, so that they continue to work? Not very many. It's also not a very viable business model because um, the better the assistive technology vendor does his work or her work, the um, smaller the customer base. And so on a very small customer base, they have to continuously upgrade, update the, the particular products. So they can't keep up with development. And so what is happening in the assistive technology industry is while all other ICT is decreasing in cost, increasing in availability, functionality, and reliability, assistive technology is increasing in cost, decreasing in availability, functionality, and reliability. The other area that needs to be addressed is legislation and policy. Um, one of the unfortunate things is that it, it's, um, I'm actually someone who's written a lot of legislation and who's an advocate for legislation. But um, having gone through that exercise, I know that accessibility in legislation and policy is interpreted as an absolute binary. Something is either accessible or inaccessible which requires a one-size-fits-all solution or a one-size-fits-all um, legal approach. And that means that laws are very inflexible and blunt instruments for a very complex domain, which is learning. 
They're hard to update and keep current. And so the unfortunate thing is that while the laws are very necessary, they've acted as um, a constraint on innovation and curriculum delivery within school systems. And then the, the thing that was most shocking to us is we did some research in special service delivery. So all of those individuals who currently um, have difficulty in accessing uh, the learning that we are providing do have these special services that help them. Um, but what we discovered with the special services is that we are spending more on excluding individuals from service and policing service than on service delivery. So, um, and what is happening is this ecosystem where the criteria continue to be tightened and then the squeezed out groups advocates for new eligibility categories and we have a dwindling and uh, ever decreasing amount of funding to actually deliver the service and uh, deliver the training. But this is not a renovation nightmare story. There's a bright side. Um, and the bright side is that what we've developed to fix the doable task is very useful for addressing foundations and then some. And there's a growing community that like the idea and want to pitch in. So what, what we have developed is flow. And flow is based on some very, very simple notions, which you'll all, probably all agree with, that every learner learns differently, that digital resources and delivery mechanisms can easily be reconfigured. We all learn better when education the education environment and the content matches our individual learner needs. And something it, that we've been trying to encourage is to think of disability as relative. It depends upon the individual, the context, and the learning goals. And we can deliver one size fits one learning. So Flow is a matching service for learning. There are three main parts, a pluggable utility to enable learners to discover and express individual needs, a service that transforms resources, augments resources, and finds alternative resources to match the individual needs, and a demand supply pipeline of possible producers to meet the demands and fill the gaps. And we have, and I won't <laughs> get into this very much, but we're powered under the hood by a number of things which we can talk about later. But we're also definitely powered by an expanded diverse community of producers, peer producers, and uh, derivatives reuse and sharing. And this resonates because it's completely in line with OER principles and goals. It encourages innovation and diversification of OER. And the nice thing is, of course, for the learner, the learner doesn't need, especially the learner who's presently facing barriers, they don't need to qualify for special services, fit into categories, or compromise their learning needs. And it invites broader, more diverse engagement in OER. So what are we doing, and how does this relate to fixing the foundations? Um, we're, we've discovered that this approach can also be used to address the problems of digital technology development. And to do that, or to help with that, we've created something called the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure. There we're applying the flow concept to address digital inclusion. And I invite you to go to the website, gpii.org, to learn more. Imagine if you could pick up any device anywhere, and it would automatically adapt to you. The person picks up the device and it changes size. Imagine someone who was usually confused by technology now every computer looks like their personal device. Simple, but just the controls and features they need. Complicated computer screen changes to a simple version. Imagine a student who has to use computers in different labs and classrooms. If all of them worked exactly as needed. A student in two classrooms, each computer becomes accessible as she needs it. There's a way to offer accessibility solutions to more people in more situations. We call it the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure, or GPII. The GPII will use the cloud, the electronic networks that power most of our information services, and the intelligence and electronic products themselves. Cloud and server symbols and button lines show information both. Right now, we use the cloud to store information, transmit it to the right destination, and convert it from one form into another. Information moves into a round and back out of a cloud to various devices. The GPII will take the same cloud idea and use it to support accessibility. 
Users will start with a wizard that helps them choose how they want their personalized interface to look and work. President, compute linking sections. And store that profile in the cloud so that it's available from then on. Profile information flows into the cloud. Accessibility developers will create tools for the toolbox that address those needs. Accessibility software flows into the cloud. The GPII will store information about devices, their uses and features. Device information flows into the cloud. Then, when a user needs an accessibility feature, the GPII will take the right user profile and features, check the device, and guide the device in using its own features to meet the user's needs. Accessibility information flows from the cloud to the phone. Screen changes to large print. The GPII will automatically apply the right tool to whatever device the person is using, wherever it is. So the interface will work the right way. The same person now sees large print on a training ticket machine. The GPII will be great for users. It will support independence with enabling technology. When you need it, where you need it, how you need it. There's no need to explain, negotiate, or justify anything. It just works. So this is a... A, a piece of the story that I, I can't resist telling is um, we've made some very strange friends through this whole process. And one of those strange friends is economists. They seem to like us. And the reason why economists like us is um, because we are creating a system where we're part of the type of technology that is good for inclusive prosperity and sustainable economic growth. The idea is that um, we're in an extreme push market. Much of what you buy if you take away housing is spent on things you're persuaded you need rather than things you actually need, which means that anyone that wants to produce something and sell something to you has to invest most of their money in marketing and, and um, commercialization, which leaves very little money for actual production and innovation. And um, almost no one can break into the market, especially not low-income countries or young entrepreneurs with great ideas. So um, what we're doing, and many of the other projects here are doing as well, is providing a direct pipeline between diverse demand and diverse supply. And this supports inclusive prosperity. And we've discovered it's really nice to have economists on our side and, and arguing for us. So what I want to end with is the note that the margins are not marginal. They encompass everything you do. And um, what our concerns and the issues and the things we're trying to fix are part of what you need to do. Um, and how can you help? Um, first, remember, all learners learn differently. We need to stop designing for the average or typical learner and help learners discover and express their individual learner needs. We need to create reconfigurable, flexible OER and encourage a diversity of derivatives. Um, and we need to collect information about the usefulness of each resource so that that will help the next user. And how can you be part of this? We're looking for partners for pilots, um, OER developers and producers, OER delivery projects, and OER implementers. And for more information about Flow, go to flowproject.org.